Good morning. My name is Marcy Strumgren, and you've tuned in to Just the Facts. I have in the studio today Lauren Martell. He's been a watchdog of the 709 School District since way back, and I want to welcome you, Lauren, for coming in today. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Lauren has a lot to say about the upcoming referendum that you will be facing on May 14th. Um, I think it's important for you to hear the information that Lauren has gathered over a period of time because it's going to affect you and your tax dollars once again. So Lauren, let's get started. Oh, you want me to just jump right in? Okay, um, I would say there's you know like four very salient points uh, in regard to this and I'll just kind of lay them out and then we can get into them in depth if you want to go that way a little bit. And the first one, of course, is just the, the level of the tax levy, and everyone should be aware of it, that you know, according to their truth and taxation um, presentation last December, um, their projected tax levy for 2024 is uh, $46.3 million. Um, so if you add another $5.29 million to that, um, that would bring it up to $51.6 million. Uh, you know, an enormous amount of money um, per year. Um, and if you look at the tax levy history, um, just two decades ago in 2003, it was $8 million. So more than a six-fold increase. And so, of course, the public um, has a right to have a, ask a few questions and have a couple of concerns about how high it's gone and exactly what we've gotten for that money. So that's the first point. The second point I, I would like to bring up is that... Um, um, a lot of people don't realize yet, it wasn't really reported locally, but it's a, it's a very important point, and that is that they can renew that levy. They have the authority to do that now. The uh, state legislature gave them that last year. And that is without the voter approval? Without voter approval, yes. Um, so if they take it for 10 years, then that would be $52.9 million. They can renew it in 10 years for another $52.9 million, so that would be $105.8 million over 20 years. So I would stress to people, um, if you have some concern about that, or you should at least be concerned enough to show up at the polls on May 14th. If you want to vote for it, fine, but you should realize exactly what the tax liability is here and that uh, you may not have another say for 20 years on, on over $100 million if you, don't, if you don't vote on it. And the other point, of course, is that they even gave it to them on existing levies. And they have a, right now a $5 million a year, 10-year levy in place so that ex, that expires in 2028, and they can renew that as well. And, they, and I do believe they will do that in four years, renew that one for another 50 million. So there's a lot of money at play here. I think there's all kinds of other issues in terms of the money, of the tax liability and around maintenance, et cetera. The, We've got a lot of buildings here that are going to need maintenance shortly. They've made them all new or like new in a little span of time without any maintenance plan, and they don't really have a good plan in place for that other than going to the taxpayers in the near future. And the former facilities manager did warn them, it's been six years that we had a five to ten year grace period, and then we were going to get hit with a huge number. You know, multiple buildings are going to need roofs at the same time. So there's just so much tax liability here. That, you know, the public should really think about it. I, I believe that anybody has a right to think about and, and question the tax liability. Well, um, first of all, they need to know about it before they can think about it. Right, you know, and again, that, and, and I, if I can just take one step back, I, you, know, you know, I get accused of, um, you know, just being anti-district, that sort of thing. It's, it's a bunch of nonsense. Um, um, I was... I used to be a died and enrolled Democrat. I, I supported every referendum. I even supported all three tiers of the referendum in 11 during the heart of the red plan because we had just lost 70 teachers that year. We lost 45 the year before. I mean, it was falling apart from, from the foolish decisions that they had made. And I was concerned about public education. I, I think anybody uh, should be concerned about education in general. It is our future. Um, they play the kid card all the time, though, and they try to use that to make you not think about anything else, you know? And I do uh, think that the taxpayers should be brought into this conversation as well. I, um, at the last presentation that they held on the referendum last fall, and I went to all three of them, I'm the only one that did, um, whenever, and the other two people that showed up there, um, Francis Wittenberg and, and Richard Paulson, 
were gone, I was still talking to the chair and the superintendent for a while, and they both said, we're doing it for the children. We're doing this for the children. And I said, yeah, okay, you know, I, yeah, I'll give you that. You, you know, of course you're concerned about the children, but who's looking out for the taxpayers? I, you know, I, I just don't think anybody really is in this. And, and obviously, you know, they should have a voice at the table as well. So it's very important to consider that. And, you know, at those, at those um, presentations, um, John Magus admitted to the public that they didn't deliver on their promise the last time they got the $5 million a year for 10 years. Um, they failed to reduce class sizes. That's how they had sold, they sold it to the public back then. And he was explaining to the public that they failed to deliver. And in fact, he, he, he had his explanation a little wrong. He, he was um, actually referring to something that had happened in 2012 when he was talking about 2017. Um, and I told him, you know, that, you know, you know, what happened in 2017 was the health care reimbursement arrangement blew up on them by over a million dollars all of a sudden. They had to cut a million and a half mid-year in, in December of, of 17, you know, middle of uh, fiscal year 18. And I pointed out to him, you know, that, you know, that's, that's really the reason that they, that they broke the promise is, is that um, the teacher contracts, the employee contracts, were excessive to what they could, could afford um, in, in, at that moment, the way the budget was. And they knew that when they, when they actually signed those contracts. You know, I get those um, closed sessions recordings after, after the contracts are signed. That becomes public information. I'm the only one that puts in the information requests and listens to what went on behind closed doors. And I actually gave that to John when he came to town, the, the thumb drive. And I said, you should listen to this because you know, I think you're still in the same pattern where you're signing contracts you can't afford. And that's one of the reasons you don't follow up on your promises that money gets diverted over here, you know, instead. And I told the News Tribune during the last election that that's effectively a bait and switch on the public. You're, you're, you're saying you're gonna do all this and then you're signing contracts and that's where it's going to go. And I said, you know, um, you, you're in the same position. Um, th that healthcare reimbursement arrangement is going to blow up again, uh, the contract language is still the same and, and still is now, you know, six years later, where if it blows up again, 95% comes out of the district's budget and the union's on a hook for 5%. I don't think that's a contract that should stay in effect. Um, and there's a lot of other things about the contracts. Uh, at the Denfeld presentation, um, the chair of the board, Jill Lofald, let it slip that they're giving the teachers a 3% raise. She just came around and said, name that as one of the reasons why they needed more money. And John Magus said, well, you know, that's still a negotiation, but she let it slip. And I think that they're likely to at least give a 3% raise. And I had the figure with me um, when I was talking to John. And I said, you know, it, it, you know last time they gave a 3% raise in 15, that was 4.2 million across all the bargaining units. We're nearly a decade out. That's gonna be about 5 million now in, in, in um, employee benefits in the previous four years had been going up by over, you know, around $2 million a year. And I said, you know, we're in the same pattern, aren't we? You know, I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna have all these increased expenses. Um, the revenue was, is significant from the state this time. They gave them a 4% increase on the per pupil formula and that brought in 2.7 million, but that's still, the revenue is still well, well below what their expenses are likely to be. So aren't we in the same danger where you're going to give a pro you're making a promise on a big investment here, but likely that a lot of money's get, going to get drained off again and you're not going to deliver on the promise. And he, and he said, I hope not. But, you know, I'm not, my hope isn't is too strong on that. I, I think that there's good reason, given, given the track record of the place and all the broken promises that have been made on savings from the red plan and, you know, they're going to use the money from the sale of Century to Central to pay down the, the, the tax burden. They just kept that money. They've broken so many promises over the pa past several years. Um, and by his own admission, they broke their promise on the last $5 million a year, 10 years. They didn't deliver on small, smaller class sizes. So there's good reason to question whether or not the promise, promises will be kept. And my final point is, who's going to really oversee this, you know? Who is going to oversee it for 10 years? I mean, 
there's a lot of stuff here. I don't know if you've seen the, the plan, but it's ex, it's, ex, it is quite extensive, uh, ten year plan, and and it um, who's going to really watch this for ten years? I mean. One of the problems always is in government is the continuity of management. You know, is John Magus going to be here 10 years from now? Um, I mean, the chair of the board is in their second term. The vice chair is in their third term. And not that the board's been very good at keeping track anyway, but who's going to really make sure that all of this is delivered in the percentages that they claim for the next 10 years? I, I personally doubt that that's going to, going to be followed through on very effectively over 10 years. And there's good reason to wonder about that, um, just how well this promise will be kept. And finally, it is just a, it's a money pit. You know, um, that's the other thing I hear from people. Um, you know, it's a lot of money in technology. We've thrown a lot of money into technology over the years. I mean, the red plan, my God, what we threw into the, to the technology in the red plan. And part of it, um, is smart boards again and and um, well when we get into a little bit more conversation i'll lay out what happened with the red plan and their smart board investment um again it was a failed promise um it, it went south on them uh, that investment went south there's been a lot of investments that have gone south and i and i am concerned about promises being kept proper oversight over it um you know just um you know whether or not um what we what we give them is really going to be delivered on and and that promise is going to be kept i really have deep concerns about it i have a lot of concerns not only about this this district but in public education in general and and the kind of money we've been throwing at it and and the kind of returns we're getting for for that money i i just at times i wonder if it's even sustainable but when you see a levy go up um over six fold in two decades it, it locally and, and then you look at what we've really delivered on education. I think it, there's good reason to at least question some of it. Really, I do. I think a bigger conversation be, should be had here than we're having. It's just a big spin factory over there right now. They're spinning and spinning and spinning, and all the board members are you know, repeating the spin. But I think we should have a real conversation at some point, especially when you get a levy this high. Well, there's many questions that have come up since you've yeah, I'm sorry. Yep. No, 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 that's fine. <laughs> um, so just to clarify for people who may be not paying attention because they don't have the children in school, who is Joe uh, Luftall, who is she, and who is McManus? Is that the name of the fellow that, that you're talking about? Is that your superintendent, Ron? His name is John Magus, yeah. Magus, yep. the superintendent He's of schools. He's the superintendent, and, and Jill Lofall is the chair of the board. Joe yep. Lofall, yep. okay. Um, and I think another problem, um, now are you going to these uh, school board meetings on a regular basis? I haven't. I never go. I never go to them. I watch. I watch a lot on on YouTube now. I I, I okay. can't. I never go to the meetings in person hardly ever. Yeah. Okay. At one time, you were there all the time taking notes because yeah. I know I was filming at the same time. Yeah. Um. So people can watch these, uh, on the YouTube channel. And yeah. why don't you give the name of the YouTube channel so we can direct people to. Uh, Oh, you watch. just, yeah, if you just go to ISD 709 board meetings, it comes up, you know. Okay. It really isn't too hard to find them. And they, and they put them up there real quickly after the meetings are over with? Relatively, relatively quickly, yeah. Well, you know, I know uh, when I was uh, monitoring uh, Lauren, they were not recording those. And I, re I, I recorded for about 11 and a quarter years. They finally, towards the end of that, started ro recording so that, people could if they take the time to go look at them. Yeah. It seems to me that anyone that has children in the school, especially, should be ma watching them, taking the time to see what's really going on. And now this new superintendent, he's basically lockstepping what went on prior to him coming here, right? Well, it, it, I, was, I, had hope, I, had, I had hope when he first came to town. I truly did. Um, when he first got here, he reached out to me within a few days of coming here. Um, um, I appreciated that. Um, brought me down there. We had a long discussion right out of the gate. And I thought, well, here's somebody that might listen to another point of view. But I, I lost a lot of faith, frankly, to be honest with you. I still like the guy personally. 
but I've lost a lot of faith in him, the way he handled those referendums last fall. Um, in fact, we, we kind of locked horns a bit at the ALC presentation, and I asked him, I said, uh, you know, John, are you, you really feel that you are fully informing everyone? That's what he kept saying. I just want to fully inform everyone. I said, you really think you're fully informing everyone, especially on this bond referendum? You know, I said, people don't know what this is out there. I've, I've been to many, many doors. They don't know what it is. They're not fully informed. And he said, I'm not lying. And I said, of course you're not lying. You know, you're not, you know, you are refinancing. You are, you know, uh, freeing up 2.6 million. But I said, I don't think it, it's presenting an accurate present um, accurate description at all to the public exactly what that burden is, the claim of one dollar and everything. It, I, you know, you can, you can, you can tweak things, you know, you can, you can say things in a way that are not really a lie, but, you know, it's not really informing the public, it's creating a, a misimpression. And I, and there was a lot of that that went on, and I think there's still a lot that goes on. And I, and I guess that's always been my objection. I remember years ago, I, I cornered Bill Gronseth in, in Old Central. We got into the discussion. I said, Bill, you know, um, just tell the public the truth, you know. Tell them that you made some mistakes. Admit it. Tell them the truth. And I'll stand by you if you do that, you know. I, and I would have, you know, even though I would have taken a lot of heat for doing it. But I do think that in, in the long run, it, it, it's counterproductive to tell the public a story and they use that word all the time now, story, our, our story. They say that all the time in the boardroom. I, I just don't think that telling the public a story is the right way to go. I think you're better off telling them the truth. And that's why I was hoping that I would get for, from John. I think we would have gotten that better, and no offense to John intended, but I did back his, his competitor for the role. Uh, he lost four to three to John. His name was Mike Funk. Um, he was from Albert Lee's, a superintendent over there, won Superintendent of the Year Award two years ago for his work over there. Um, I, I just think that he was willing to put things on the table. In fact, he said, you know, during his, during his interview um, that it was time to go back to the future, to start looking at what we had done, seeing what we can do to correct it. He wanted to go back to Central and take a new look at STC up there. He said, it's a wonderful facility. It's sitting there empty. It's been empty all these years. You know, let's take a new look at it all. He wanted to do that, and I thought it was time to do that. And unfortunately, yeah, Gronset set all of this up, and John came in here, you know, in John's defense, um, you know, it was the pandemic hit. There was a lot of stuff hitting him, and this thing was, was on the tracks, you know, Grant said they got it on the tracks, the DFL had gotten it on the tracks down in the Capitol and everything, and he just ran with it. And from then on, he's been just stuck in that rut that, that Bill kind of set up. And I, and I do think at the end of the day, um, it's not a good way to govern because you, you alienate so many people by doing that. Man, I, the people in this town, uh, you know, they, they are very forgiving if you, were, if you were to play it straight. I think it would have been a better way to go. Um, the same thing with the way they handled that uh, extension to the red plan, building those new buildings up on the central property and, and Xing out the two clauses that had anything to do with the election. They literally erased them out of the statute so the public had no say. I'm the only one that showed up for the public hearing. Um, you know, I think that, you know, governing that way when i when i'm out there and people to this day a lot of people don't even know they built those two new buildings yet you know up there it's just amazing to me you know um let's, i don't think that's a good way to govern let's stop right there and yeah. tell them what they built up there well they built uh, you know two new buildings uh, an administration building and, and, a, and a bus barn a big heated bus barn for their bus fleet and a, and a service um stall in there and, um um it was a 31 and a half million dollar project and um, the interest on that, they just, they just um, uh, issued that bond, uh, 2024A bond, uh, $6 million of interest on that, on that bond. So, um, so we're looking at um, almost, uh, um, you know, almost uh, $40 million totally, uh, if I'm correct. Let me see if I'm, maybe it was $32.5 million. It's up there nearly $40 million anyway with interest, um, $39.5 with interest. I must have Miss, miss something in the way I calculated that. But, um, oh, that's uh, six million, that's, nope, that is actually the 2021 C bond, that's what's wrong. Okay, yeah, it's the 21, 
2021 C bond is the one for up there. The 2024 A bond is for the bond referendum they just passed. And that's six million. But on that one, there's $8 million of interest. The $31.5 million bond and the total is $39.5 million. And they deferred those payments out um, to 2029 also um, so that they could kind of hide them from the public out there because most of the bond debt is paid in 28, so our taxes were going to drop, so they deferred it out there. So subsequently, we're paying $8 million of interest on that bond. Um, you know, the Fed rate in 21 was zero. The interest rates were low, but they deferred it all, up, all the way out there. Um, so that we have um, about $8 million a year for five years that we'll be paying starting in 2029 for those two new buildings up there. Um, I do think... Um, $8 million per year. year. Yeah, for, for five years. Yeah, almost just shy of $8 million per year for now, five how, years. How much money was spent in demolishing the old central? Um, that it, is another issue because we didn't sell the property. That is right. another issue that people never take into consideration well, they, as part of the expenses. Yeah, right. You're absolutely right. And yeah, they um, they actually did report the demolition cost, um, which was, I think, if I remember, memory serves me right, about 140 um something like that. Um, can't remember now. 1.4, I think, 1.4 million or something. But oh um, the the asbestos abatement was not included in that in their reporting, and that brought it up to almost three million. Oh my goodness! With asbestos abatement, I've got those two contracts on asbestos abatement, and so that was never reported out in the mainstream media. Um, that they you know, they were up there for months with asbestos abatement. Uh, it was 1.6 million for the primary contractor, and then. Um, it was a $25,000 rider um, for um, testing for air quality around there, and then there was $1,000 a day, just shy of $1,000 a day to test every day up there while it went on, and they were up there for a long time. I never did get the full amount on that, but the whole cost was in the neighborhood of $3 million to, to take it down with the asbestos abatement included. And did, again, that was never reported around. Yeah. Did they take down the... Um, STC building with the greenhouse and all of that did they t with and, and the restaurant did they take all of that oh, down? you know and that's just that's another thing that just it, it to me is so heartbreaking I, I mean this goes on and on and on and on and I've been involved in it and I've been involved in this whole thing again where they're up there now that you know they they made a deal with the developer on that property up there you know now and um STC now, you know, it was only 16 years old when it was shut down. It's and we been, hadn't even paid off $90,000? No, we had to spend 2.3 million is what we paid while it sat there empty. 2.3 million we paid. We, uh, we got it paid off in 15, uh, 2015, about four years after it was shut down. But now it's been sitting empty for 13 years. Um, uh, still only 29 years old, um, 52,000 square foot building. It's still sitting there empty. And um, they now, this developer, um, do have it on there that they may demolish it. They're not sure what they're going to do, but it is one of the op op options is to just tear it down. It's still only 29 years old. Um, I mean, I just, it, to me, um, the waste up there on that, on that um, property alone is just, is, it's heartbreaking, really. I mean, they... Um, they put a, a brand new tennis courts, new running track, all that, all baseball, that work, all baseball, that stuff yeah. on the on the on the playgrounds up there in the stadium and everything. Millions they spent just a decade before they shut it down. Then they shut down the high school. It was only 40 years old. <laughs> it was it had a built, uh, replacement value of 50 the 60 million, um, and and they shut it down. Leave it sit there for 10 years. We lost a whole bunch of money while on uh, maintenance and heating and everything for 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 10 years. And then we spent, like I said, nearly $3 million to tear it down. It was only, still only 51 years old by the time we, we, we finally tore it down. Uh, 228,000 square foot building. I tell people it's like adding Congdon onto the old central downtown. You know how big that is downtown. It's yeah. like adding Congdon onto that. That's how big that school was up there. Tore it all down, threw it in a landfill. And then, you know, and now we've got STC sitting there and it may even get demolished. It's still only 29 years old. And like you said, it cost 13 million to build it. It was a 52,000 square foot beloved building, great educational facility. It's been sitting there for 13 years. I mean, it, it's so disgusting the, the way our money has been wasted here. It, 
it, to me, it's just it's not it's not sustainable to to spend our money this way. We've just simply got to get better use of our tax dollars. And I've been I've been involved in in that issue again in, with the city council. I just don't think um, the options they have on 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 the table are very good to handle the traffic up there or or, or anything. I don't know if you know that this that the person that's pushing that. I don't want to get too far down the track on this, but this is kind of important to know that the person who one of the principals for these developers up here on the on the central property was the account as executive for Johnson Controls. He's back, Jeff Schultz, he's back. He, he was the one pushing so much of the, of the spin on the, on, on the red plan. Now he's back with this new, he's coming in to kind of profit off the, off the, off the, the waste up there and making God knows how much money again on this big development that they're putting up there. He's the one pushing it. He's got a new company uh, started up and he's back um, um, representing the developers here and it's the same guy and he's spinning, spinning, spinning like he did before and they're all following him around like he's the Pied Piper again. So I do think, again, the, I'll just, I, again, I, I think it's related to this and I do think it's related to, the, to the, all the problems that we've had and I think that they're, they're I, and I've said it repeatedly as a candidate, that you need, um, what you really need in terms of diversity is intellectual diversity and you need that in government so that you have a good discussion on the front end and you vet things properly. You vet ideas properly before they're implemented as decisions and I think that's been a problem throughout this process. The problem with one party rule, I pointed out repeatedly as a candidate that you know, group thought just doesn't work. You know, it doesn't work very well. It, it, you, and, and there's just too many, too many special interests that they, that they bow down to. Um, you know, let's face it, you know, these special interests pay for their campaigns um, and now it's payback time. You know, they come in there and they, and they twist arms and it's payback time. And I just don't, I think there's a flaw in the way the, the, the whole town is governed. But, but obviously in the school board room, it's been the worst example of it. And we've been taken to the cleaners just on that campus alone, look at the waste. And we were supposed to get 14, well, we could have sold it for 14.2 million. We ended up pay, getting 7.8 million and they didn't even use the money for tax relief as they promised. They ended up keeping it in the budget and they broke that promise to the public. You know, it's just, to me, it's just been uh, unacceptable how badly the public has been taken for a ride on all of this. Well, I have uh, a little thought that always goes on in my mind. Truth is stranger than fiction. We don't live in a society that talks truth anymore. They spin so many things, and that is called lying. And people are so used to it, they don't, they don't even recognize it. But when somebody that is spinning a lie gets elected to the board, you got to wonder, okay, I think you just said it, how they got elected. They want to carry the water buckets of those people. And the public is unaware what's going on because we have the controlled media that doesn't tell the truth. And we have, that includes your, your other types of media around here, which is your TV stations and most of the radio. So how will people find out about the truth if, they, if there are no publications that print it and radio stations that don't talk it, TV stations that don't present it? It's, it's blind leading the blind. And when you go out there and vote, you need to think about this second referendum failed last fall. So why did it fail? The question is, how many people knew what they were doing when they went out and voted and passed that first one and didn't pass this one? Well, it was for technology. It was kind of listed as technology. Suppose they thought maybe they don't need more technology because we just put it all in. They don't know that the technology is obsolete not too long after they get it installed. I took a class at Ordine Middle School that never had a classroom in it, and I got that from the janitor. I took a journalism class there. There had never been a class in there. And if you go around the school, I had never been in the high school, 
there's a lot of paper on a lot of windows. They don't even have classes in some of those rooms. And that's why your classes are crowded because you don't have the teachers to provide that. So I do know from a woman who has taken her kids out of the public school system, put them in an alternative education, they are going up one more year at a time and they took out 100 kids from the ninth grade, the year her child started. Yep. So people are finding alternatives, but we're still paying for on our taxes and we're forced to pay it. Yeah. So I hope this information, I hope people will get this information. We need to disperse it as much as possible, but let's do a little bit. You had four major points there. So do you want to fill in a little bit more on each one? Yeah. And, and I also just want to, and I want to fill in just on what you said here. I, I think it's a good point. I mean, um, you know, what is, what are the priorities? I mean, a lot of people have asked me that too, you know, um, it's such a, it's, it seems to be almost an, a bottomless money pit on this technology. Um, you, you've got to have uh, cybersecurity insurance, for example, now. And you can't, you can't even get insurance unless everything is com completely updated all the time. So they've got you in so many ways on this thing. And people have asked me and, and, and I th and, and raised the concerns about the very thing you're talking about. And that is, you know, how do we get classes size down, class sizes down? Um, you know, is it really, you know, should we put another 52.9 million into technology or should we be putting it in the teachers and getting those class sizes down? Um, we haven't, we've spent so much money and we're not that competitive in the educational marketplace. Um, and we are nowhere near um, what they projected the enrollment was going to be, well over a thousand students below what they projected from the red plan. Um, so, um, you know, you know, how do you spend that money best? And then I think it's a fair question. You know, you know, just how how much is the technology worth? I'm not saying it's not worth anything. It's it's you know, it's obviously the way the world is run now, and you just have to be up to up to speed on it. But um, you know. I know some people too. I, I know a woman, for example, she and her, her friend went out and they, and they had five kids between them and they were looking at the public schools and her, her father was a public school teacher so she wanted to send her kids to public schools. And she said, you know, one of the, there were two things, the, the, the bus ride from the Red Plan, you know, they had to take this long bus ride. She said the other thing was just the class sizes. They were, they were just too big. And so they had five kids and they, they picked another, another option. Um, and so it is a really important thing in, in, in the marketplace as well. It, there's a market part of this. And, and that's the other thing that to me has always been missed in, in this whole discussion is that it is an educational marketplace. You've got to make moves almost like a business that you have to be aware of the market, you know, and for all these, all the money we spent, we've done very little to position ourselves in the market. You know, it's also obviously, you, you know, having small classes is better for education. It's better for the teachers to burn them out. Um, but it also just is a marketplace driver as well. It, it, it's a big, it's a big thing in people's minds, you know, the class sizes when they go and look at where they're going to send their kids. So, you know, people have asked me, you know, um, you know, is this the best way we can use our money is just continually dump all this money in, in the technology. Again, we dumped a lot into the red plan. Um, and within four years after it was over, they were already calling them obsolete and wanting to throw them in, in dumpsters. And then, you know, we threw a lot in during the pandemic. We're going to throw another 50 plus million if they even keep up on this plan that which is questionable, I think, in and of itself. But at the same time, where's all this money going to come from? I mean, there's a larger question at, 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 in play here for me. It's just the sustainability of the whole thing. You know, I mean, you look at, and when I got involved with this, you know, what drew me in, first of all, you know, I, I, you know, I couldn't believe I was not going to have a vote on it. Biggest consolidation in the history of state, and, you know, and that really upset me. And then I, I didn't believe so much of it. I, did, I thought it would worsen the east-west divide, and that's what it did. I didn't believe the financing. I thought the idea of selling all this excess property was nonsense. I mean, they dumped 
10 buildings, eight of them school buildings, and 200 acres on the market at the same time. In a little town like this, they eliminated their primary customer, other educational organizations, and claimed they were going to sell them all quickly and at top dollar. It made no business sense. It made no business sense. I mean, where was the market for them? So, you know, there were so many flaws in the whole thing. I didn't believe it was going to be half paid for through the financing. I never believed it. But I also, when I got in there, I just started looking at the whole system and, and how it's run and then locally. And then I looked at the state and I'm more and more, more questioning, you know, how this thing is working because you take the state, 2.26 billion they, they put in the public education last year. And a third of the districts are broke already. Within a couple more years, I believe they'll all be broke. Uh, you take the Anoka Hennepin district, which is the largest in the state, 38,000 kids. I mean, this was an NPR story, not some right wing story. This was on NPR's website. Um, you know, they spent all of their money. I mean, 38,000, um, the, the, the uh, per pupil formula went up by 275 dollars a kid so add it up you know on 38,000 kids of so ten and a half million dollars they spent it all on their contracts all of it it's gone you know they gave a five percent raise and and and, and, a, and and a bonus and a bunch of other stuff and and so i do wonder about it's like it almost seems like it's an endless bottomless pit i've asked the question repeatedly you know where is you know where is the bottom line on this you know do you just have to give them a blank check uh, and, and it's not sustainable in my, in my opinion. We just, to me, there should be some reforms. The other side, and I used to be a hardcore DFLer, but I questioned more and more just throwing more money at the problem and not reforming anything. I thought it was time for an audit of the MDE. I mean, Ryan Wilson, one of the candidates for the, the state auditor's position, went around and said that, and he wanted to spot audit school districts again. I thought it was time to do that. Instead, they expanded the MDE by 48 positions. So I do think that, as I said during the last campaign, you know, it, to some degree, it's like you know, enabling an alcoholic, you know, just to continue throwing money in without some kind of basic reforms. And I'm not sure, like the whole country, <laughs> which I think is, you know, um, I look at the national debt and where it's going by mid by mid century. I think it, you know, the whole thing seems to be reeling out of control. And my point has always been, you know, if you're going to get any control, it starts in your backyard. And I, from the beginning, I, just the way they've blown money, you look at a levy, again, that's gone up by over, will go up here if they get this, by over sixfold in two decades. And what, you know, how much have we moved the needle on education? And I, I do question um, the, the viability of it. I truly do. And I think that's a, a larger question that I think is worth having. Um. And that's my issue. We have not moved the needle of education forward. It is backwards. When you have kids that come out of school, third or fifth grade education, there is something wrong with the entire system. There's enough people that are, I mean, there's a small amount of people that are pulling their children out. However, there's not enough people shouting from the rooftops, get your house in order. Yeah, we're not. We're not hearing from the populace that we need to hear from. So. And I'm not saying it's all bad. I mean, and and there's that that there's not dedicated teachers, and that they don't love education, and that they're not dedicated to it. Uh, and I'm not putting down uh, teachers or anything like that. I I know there's a lot. Of, I've seen them myself. I, I in, you know I've, I've I've had a lot of interpersonal. Um, contact with with teachers, et cetera, and man, they care a lot. They really do, and they work hard. It's a hard job. I'd hate to be a teacher right now. Can you imagine what it's like? No. I mean, no. It, they, they they barely have any control. I, when, when I was out as a candidate last time, I ran into some teachers. I ran into some a para. She said it's just it's just crazy in there. She said it, you know, um, some of the the school she was in. She was just describing some things to me that once upon a time just would not have been allowed to happen, no. just would not have been allowed to happen. And they barely can control um, the kids at times in those schools. And it's just a horrible situation where you're trying to teach in that environment. So I have a lot of 
lot of empathy for them, but can we fix it by, it doesn't, we've thrown a lot of money at it, we haven't fixed it, uh, it doesn't seem like we're getting anywhere, it only seems like it's getting worse that way, so I do question whether or not, I do believe that the question should be on the table and, and we should have a discussion about it, let me put it that way, it's about how we spend this money, I, I've tried to have that debate for some time. You know, we're not made of money. Um, you know, it doesn't grow on government trees, so we only have so many dollars to go so far. And again, whether or not, you know, it turns out to be the right decision to throw another 52.9 million into technology, even if they deliver on that promise, is a discussion that the public should really have. At some point, we, you know, because we, we've got to get good value out of our dollars, we don't, we don't have unlimited number of dollars. We just don't, and we can't continue to do it. Um, so I do think that, you know, I would like to see a better discussion and there wasn't really any discussion at all in the boardroom about it. Just, you know, we need to do this in a, in a lecture about why the public had to give this money again. You know, we just have to, you know, it, it's the right thing to do. Henry Banks said, you know, and, and, and during the, my com competitor in the last election, he told everyone they were obligated to pay. And, you know, and I don't believe they're obligated to pay. Um, you know, I, I if they want to pay, it's up to them. But I think that that has to be earned. You know, I don't think it's an obligation. I think that the district has to earn the the trust of the public if they want them to pay. And it's the public's right to to make that decision whether or not they trust that that organization to deliver on those dollars. And we should have a real debate, and the public should have a right to have a say about whether or not they think their money has been prioritized correctly and whether or not they're going to get where they really want to go with education by spending 52.9 million this way. And I think that discussion should have been had in the boardroom. And that's my argument for uh, you know, allowing other voices in the government in Duluth and having a broader debate you know, on these investments right on the front end. You know, I think there should be a more thorough debate in government. And I'm, Thank you for having, you know, this forum anyway, so that you know some other viewpoints can be aired. It's really important, I think. Well, and the only way that we're going to get this heard is it'll be up on my YouTube channel, um, just the facts. But it'll be it'll be on cable channel as well. We have to get the word out to other people that they should tune into this and understand what they don't know anything about. And oh, they're, absolutely. They're going to they're going to go to the polls. They're going to vote because it's for the children. But, but like I said already, the education levels are nowhere near what they used to be, um, and there is chaos in the classroom. I've talked to um, people whose family members are are there doing their best, but. There's so much that's going on the public is not even aware of that it needs to be addressed before you go to the poll and say, oh, sure, give them more money because it's going to come back to bite you in the end. Your taxes are going to increase and you're going to wonder what on earth is going on. Oh, yeah, I, I agree. I, and I, I do think that also that the public just needs to, um, you know, I... I think that you know education is incredibly important. I, it, you know, it is the future. Um, when they when they play the kid card, I, I can't disagree with it in that sense. It truly is, and and it, I I think it's the most important investment. But on the other hand, we do also have to make sure that you know at at the end of the day, we are we're we're, we're really helping the kids. And and. And my concern about the whole country is, are we really helping the kids if we're, if we're spending beyond what we, what we can afford and what are we leaving them that way, you know? And I always point out that when, you know, Dixon came to town and he kept playing the kid card that someone that was, a kid that was 10 years old was gonna be in their 40s by the time we got the bill paid off, you know, from what he did and, and we really helping that kid, you know? And it was just a big mess the entire time, big, the whole district turned into a mess from it. Did we really help those kids, you know, um, that were trying to get educated in that big mess? I, I do think that um, you have, you know, it's easy to play the kid card, but are you really helping the kids if you're doing a, if you're making a reckless investment or if you're, ca you're causing more damage or you're going to leave a big bill for them to pay off in the future? 
um, is that really helping the kids? What's really helping the kids? And, and I do think there's some people, there's been some stellar accomplishments in ISD 709, but I certainly hear a lot of the other um, and I do hear a lot from the people when they're, when they're off the record that work in the buildings about what they're dealing with in those buildings. And it is at times not very conducive to education. And, and do, you just, do you just keep throwing more and more and more money at that problem and more and more counselors or whatever? Or, or you know, what is the best approach to try to get some, a better atmosphere in those schools and also where people want to send their kids in there, you know, because that's another reason why p people are, you know, picking other options. You know, um, my my late wife was a teacher at Marshall, and you know they were paying a lot of money to go there, and, and they went there because you know it was a really small class size and not more than twenty kids in her class, and it was you know it was just the place was well ordered and 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 nobody's going to get lost in that school, and they and they knew they were going to get a really good education, and every kid was going to get really good attention. Um, it's, it's, those, it's those things that people really care about, not big swimming pools and all this. I always thought they were off, way off on the deep end in terms of the value of, of the In facilities. more ways than one. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, no, no pun intended, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I just, I just believe that you have to question the priorities about how you spend those limited dollars and just what, what will help the kids, you know? And I do think that, um, we've made some gross errors, and I just don't see a change in attitude about it. I just don't. In, in the boardroom, just give us more. Believe us now. We're going to do this now, and we, and we know what's best. And, and, um, yeah, and I think it's good. there's a good reason to question the wisdom of how we've been led. Um, I think anybody, fair-minded person, can see that things have gone a bit awry from their promises in the past. And there's good reason to question you know, whether or not their promises are going to come true this time. Certainly, I have some big questions about it. Well, um, this woman that took her two children out of the public system um, and now in this private school, I saw her father. Uh, we had uh, elections up in Normana Township where I live, and the grandfather was there, and he couldn't say enough about the quality and the atmosphere of this new school. He was just raving about what his grandchildren were now experiencing. And I have heard this term several times. Chaos in the classroom does not is not conducive to the safety of the children or their education. And my granddaughter experienced this down in Coon Rapids. She had to go home and uh, finish off her 17th year because it was so distracting. When I went to school, you were quiet. When the teacher spoke, you listened. You were respectful to the teachers. And if they sent a note home with you to your parents, you got in trouble twice. Yep. Nowadays, it's chaos in the classroom. This is what you're paying for to put these children who are at risk I mean, you didn't you didn't see fights, you didn't see disrespectfulness uh, without having a consequence to it. Today, it is chaotic in the classrooms, nope. and all we do is dump more money into things. We just keep we just keep going to the taxpayer, and now the taxpayer doesn't have any right to say no because now the state has passed the law that. The school district has the right to pass these referendums. Well, do you think if they've got the right to pass these referendums, they care one whit about us as taxpayers or parents? No. They have control. They have ultimate control, and ultimate control corrupts ultimately. So yeah. I appreciate uh, all that you're trying to do, Lauren. I'm sure it's exasperating at times because you're like crying in the wind and you know i will but say, i know, think we we well, have to keep trying to do something because the children are at stake absolutely and and i do want to say you know um and, and i appreciate you bringing up the vote part one more time 
because that's obviously been very, very important to me from the beginning. And um, <laughs> it's the heart of democracy, um, you know, and it always blows me away that my former political party, um, and I'm not aligned with either political party, to be clear on that. No, I just kind of put a pox on both parties anymore. But, um, you know, that they're the ones that talk about the sanctity of the vote, and they're always, they're the ones that are always doing this, you know. And we've, we've lost the vote so many times here in, in our school district, they, they, obviously for the red plan. And then for the extension for the red plan, those two buildings up there, again, they, they took the vote away for that. And then over the last 10 years, they've used two taxing authorities um, to move um, over $6 million that was once um, public approved operational levy money. Now it's board approved, you know, so they've been moving that way more and more. And I do think that that is the leverage that we have as citizens that, you know, to have some say. You know, if you take away our ability to vote on the money, then what leverage do we have? I mean, and especially when you've got, you know, a board that, you know, they're all in bed with the vested interests right now. My opponent, I can show you a circular here, sent out on his behalf by the teachers union while I ran against him, um, paid for by the teachers union. Um, you know, you've got sort of, you know, this is the fox guarding the hen house to some degree, you know, um, there all seven of them are, you know, um, related and, 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 and indebted to the unions um, to, in some way or manner. So I do think that the public, because of the political environment in the town and the fact that increasingly we don't have a vote, we increasingly have no say, period. I mean, and it is an issue for me that we are essentially cut out of the whole thing because they don't even give us a vote anymore. And so I'm, I'm appealing to people that they have a vote. This time, they have a vote in Maine. And it may be the last time they have a vote for 20 years on $100 million. It, um, I, they're counting on no one showing up. Um, that's why they're making us pay $100,000 for this election, uh, hoping that, you know, that no one will show up. They've lost twice in two uh, November elections over the last five years. They've tried to get it twice, a uh, te uh, technology referendum. In a November election, they've lost twice, so they think it's um, not in their favor to have a lot of people show up and vote. Um, so they're, they're doing this, hoping everyone will look down the road at November and not get to the polls in May. And, and you know, whether you decide to vote for it or not, I, I would like to see a big turnout at the polls and hear what the public have to say. But I think they're counting on the people just being asleep at the switch, um, you know, uh, that nobody's going to think that it's important or even understand what the importance of it is, what's at stake. And everyone's going to stay home. That's what they're counting on, and then they'll just load up the polls with their people and and get what they want. And I, to me, it's just it's it's a manipulation of the system, purposely trying to exploit um, the the ignorance of the public. Frankly, um, I think that the public shouldn't allow that to happen. They should take this opportunity. They haven't gotten many votes. They've got one in May. You know, and everybody, if I were I, I can't imagine anybody not showing up and, and voting for this and, and actually taking advantage of the one time you're going to have a vote. Um, I would beg people to do that. You know, what, and um, whether they, if they want to vote for it, uh, all the more power to them. That, that's their right to do what they want with their money. But please, everybody, show up. I mean, how much effort does it take? They just go and vote. And if you don't, you, you deserve what you get. You know, the public is responsible in a way because they, they don't engage enough. If, if they don't vote on this and they, and, and, and they get hit with $100 million over the next 20 years, it's on them. The other thing you have to think about is there's early voting starting on the 29th, 24th. 29th. 29th, yep. thank you. 29th of March. Yep. That is not but a few days away. Yep. So you can't use the excuse that you're going to be out of town uh, in May, you know, maybe you're on vacation or whatever, or maybe you're already out of town and you're coming back. You know, uh, a lot of people go south in the wintertime. Right. Uh, so you can get an absentee ballot and vote absentee. Oh, it's so easy. As long as yeah. you own property, you know, in the 709 school district. And this just doesn't mean the city of Duluth proper. I know when I was running first district, people didn't know in the townships that they could vote on 
709 school district issues. They had no clue. Yeah. And I said, where do you send your, your children? Duluth School District. They said, there's your answer. So even the surrounding townships need to get their people out to the polls. Absolutely. And, uh, and a lot of people just, you know, just don't seem to be awake to it. And, and that's what they're counting on, that people will be asleep. And, and I just don't think that's a good way to operate, but that's what they're doing. And the public should wake up and get to the polls, vote how you want, but please, please, you know, participate in democracy, at least to that extent. It's so easy. Like you said, you can vote early. You got like six weeks to vote or, you know, before the election and, and, and how much effort is it there to get there on, on election day? There's polls all over the place. It just amazes me. And then people complain and complain about their government and, and so many don't do that simple thing to get to the polls. I don't understand it. Um, people die all over the world. Um, for the vote out there right now, there's people fighting for democracy, for a right to have a say in their government to vote, and then we take it for granted and we don't even do it. It's so hard to get people to the polls even. Um, again, to some degree, you get the government you deserve if you don't do it, you know, and I think I've always said the public is to some degree guilty of this for not, not trying harder themselves to get engaged and at least do that basic thing of voting, just that basic exercise, that basic right as a free citizen in a democracy. Vote, 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 November, um, May 14th. I almost said November, so used to November. May 14th, May yeah. 14th, yep. Well, the other thing here that you've got to take into consideration, folks, they are spending $100,000 of your tax money for a election in May. All the years I was an election judge, which started when my son was one years old, he's now 56. Uh, all of a sudden we have a election for the school district in May. You think they're trying to hide this from you? Well, yes, I will say affirmative, they are trying to hide this from you. So uh, please, like Lauren has said, like he's explained the reason why you need to vote the ultimate income will be affecting you financially. And Thanks it, for tuning in. It affects your kids as well. Yes. It really does. Thanks Thank for coming in, Lauren. Thank you for your time.